Well, hi to everyone uh, joining this uh, webinar. It's a bit of a shame we can't meet in person, but since March this year, the world has come completely you know, upside down. And at least with uh, Tracy's uh, technological whiz, we're able to uh, carry on having uh, this uh, webinar remotely. I'm sure I've met quite a few of you uh, in person over the years, uh, but for those of you who don't know me personally, uh, I'm an off-time margins by trade. Uh, I spend my time between Cambridge and uh, Moorfields in London. Uh, for many years now, I've had a very, you know, um, you know, keen interest on these inherited eye diseases affecting the optic nerve. And uh, Wolfram syndrome has become an important element of the work I'm doing, uh, working very closely with the team of Tim Barrett in, uh, in Birmingham. And also because I see quite a few patients with Wolfram syndrome uh, in my clinic at Addenbrooke's in Cambridge and Moorfields in London. So my remit for this talk is to talk about optic nerve involvement in Wolfram syndrome, which is very important because the visual loss is something which is very worrying. It is something that we're hoping that we can stabilize in time uh, with treatment, but it is challenging as we've heard already from uh, the previous presentation. So what I want to do in my talk, because I'm sure there will be people there uh, who might be new uh, to this area, is to talk a bit about why people lose vision in Wolfram syndrome and what is optic atrophy because you'll be seeing this in clinic letters and talk about in various presentations. The second thing is what is the visual prognosis because this is crucial uh, to patients, their families and also in terms of how we design uh, clinical studies in the future to be able to really be convinced that the treatment is working. And the third thing is to really just touch upon very superficially on how we could prevent further visual loss. So a bit of introduction first about the eye and what allows us to have good central vision. And this is what you see when you look at yourself in the mirror. You see the white of the eye, the colored part of the eye, and then you have this uh, central aperture there, which is a pupil, which allows light to get into the eye. And if you look at this section here, which shows the eye and the various parts of it from the front to the back, at the front, you have the lens, which is a crystalline lens, and similar to a camera, it would allow light to focus at the back onto the retina. But you also need something to be able to, tr to convert this image into an electrical signal, and that's what the retina does. The retina is a film which lines the back of the eye. And if you take a microscope and you slice the retina, what you see here are various layers normally divided into six layers, but it's much more complex than this. But what I want you to get out of this is that there is one layer which is very important called the retinal ganglion cell layer. And the retinal ganglion cell layer is important because it is the final step which allows the signal to be transmitted from the eye to the optic nerve and then onto the brain. And when we're born, we roughly have about 1.2 million retinal ganglion cells. And the axons, which are the extensions of these nerves, uh, go at the back of the eye to form the uh, uh, optic nerve bundle. And I've already explained that the eye is there to convert the image into an actual signal. So it's a very sensitive, very sophisticated camera. And then at the back of the a brain around the occipital cortex, you have where you have all the processing happening really, right? And in between, you have the optic nerve because you need to be able to transfer the signal rapidly, efficiently from the eye to the brain. It's, it's a very fast, super fast broadband cable in terms of an analogy. And when we look at the back of the eye, that's how the optic nerve looks like, a golden yellow circle from which you see these blood vessels emerging. And these blood vessels are there to transfer all the food, oxygen, and nutrients that you need for the retina to work normally. Because the retina is working all the time. Whether you're sleeping or awake, the retina is always firing these signals and therefore it has a very high energy demand. And that's part of the reason why it tends to be affected in the genetic eye diseases. And when we think about the retina, there's one area which is even more important called the macula because the macula is what gives your central very high precise uh, vision. And if you have any damage to the macula, that's where you end up losing the central part of your vision. So this is just a diagrammatic representation, but you can imagine that if you lose the, your central vision, 
like a cookie cutter has just removed the central part, it's going to be very challenging for you to be able to read well, to be able to see things clear, clearly, and certainly you won't be able to drive based on the UK driving standards. And this type of central visual loss is called a central scotum. If you get damage to the optic nerve, then you, know, you prevent uh, this transmission of information uh, from the eye uh, to the brain. And in Wolfram syndrome, you get this damage to the optic nerve, which happens very, very early on in life. And as the damage progresses, instead of you having a golden yellow healthy looking optic disc, the optic disc becomes pale, and that's what we call optic atrophy. So when you see this pallor, unfortunately it tells us that there's already been quite a significant amount of damage that has occurred at the back of the eye. The unfortunate thing about Wolfram syndrome, which is shared by a lot of these genetic eye conditions, is that vision gets progressively worse, and there is currently no effective treatment to reverse this uh, loss of vision. And that's the reason why so much research is being invested into this area. You will probably have heard already about the diagnostic criteria for Wolfram syndrome, which was put together, uh, led by Tim Barrett and other people who are part of the Eurowa project. But the reason for putting this here is to really emphasize the two major diagnostic criteria for Wolfram syndrome, which is onset of diabetes before the age of 16, and also very importantly, uh, the presence of optic atrophy and visual loss. In my experience, you know, I think that the percentage of patients with Wolfram syndrome who have optic atrophy is much higher because there are other tests that we can do that will actually detect much more subtle subclinical involvement. So there's no doubt that this is a central part of the disease process, which is extremely important in terms of future prognosis because losing your vision gradually with time causes a lot of impairment and a lot of uh, impact on your quality of life. Uh, just very briefly, you know, about the genetics of Wolfram syndrome, because this, because this is actually relevant to uh, visual prognosis. So there are two main forms of inheritance. The first form of inheritance is a recessive uh, mode of inheritance. So in this example here, you have two parents, both of them have two copies of one gene, and in both of them, one copy of the gene has a spelling mistake, has a mutation. They are both healthy, no problem at all, because the good copy is compensating for the bad copy. So if they have a child, there are various uh, uh, scenarios that can happen. Most of the time you're lucky, either the child has two copies, which are both good, or they in inherit one copy of the spelling mistake. And again, that does not cause any disease. One in four chance, unfortunately, about 25%, the child will inherit both copies of the spelling mistake. And that's when you end up with the development of disease. And that's what you tend to see in the, in the majority of patients with Wolfram syndrome. The other important mode of inheritance is what we call dominant mode of inheritance. So in that case here, if you have one copy which is defective for the reason, the good copy can, can't compensate for this, and the bad copy trumps the good copy and you get the onset of disease. And in that case, if you have one parent who's affected, then it's 50% chance of having a child with the same condition. Back in 1998, uh, various groups work on this, but you know, essentially the major gene causing Wolfram syndrome is this gene WFS1, uh, which has been identified now in, in a lot of families worldwide. And the reason why WFS1 is very interesting is because it encodes for a protein. This protein is located within the endoplasmic reticulum, and you've heard already in the previous presentation about why this is important for the survival of the cell. But for me, the reason why it is even more important and more, even more interesting is because it has an effect on your mitochondria. And for those of you who do not know what mitochondria are, the bottom line is you need this in every cell because these mitochondria produce energy, very much like the batteries you know, in any uh, you know, a gadget that you might have. And as long as energy is being produced, all is well. But if there is anything which impacts on your mitochondria, either directly or indirectly, then you end up in big trouble because your cell does not have enough energy to work properly and gradually you're going to lose them. 
So coming back to the optic nerve, coming back to these retinal ganglion cells, we really do not know why these retinal ganglion cells are so sensitive to this dysfunction and to mutation in WFS1. There is something intrinsically you know, vulnerable with them. And the reason why they are affected is something that we need to dig into much harder because that's the only way of coming up with better treatment. And there are many reasons why your retinal ganglion cells are being affected. I think the first thing to mention is that these retinal ganglion cells are very specialized cells. If you think about it, it starts in the retina, it starts within the eye, and then the axons, the projections, go all the way back at the back of the eye, they come out of the optic nerve and they head back towards the brain. So it's a very long specialized cell and many things can go wrong in there. I think one of the things that has really you know, uh, become very relevant is this whole interaction between your endoplasmic reticulum and your mitochondria. And this is a presentation for another time, but clearly this interaction is relevant in terms of endoplasmic reticulum stress, in terms of calcium transfer between the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondria, and also in terms of energy production. So I've said this already, that the majority of patients with Wolfram syndrome will have a spelling mistake, a mutation, in both copies of the WFS1 gene. But what is also very striking and also something which is very relevant is that you can also get a form of Wolfram syndrome, a Wolfram-like phenotype, if you want to put it like this, when only one copy of the gene has a spelling mistake. And the reason I mentioned this is because the genetics is directly relevant to your visual prognosis. So we've been looking after quite a few patients with Wolfram syndrome, both in Cambridge and in Moorfield, and very often we're very fortunate that we can refer the patients to Birmingham for further assessment. But what has been quite striking to us as of our margins in looking after patients, uh, and a lot of them are coming back for regular follow-up, is that if you have a dominant mutation, you tend to have a much less severe clinical disease. You can have only optic nerve involvement, which is good because you only have the optic nerve which is affected without any of the other complications. But most often you get the optic nerve being affected together with hearing problems. So this combination is very classical and in quite a few patients that I look after have this phenotype. And potentially because of referral bias, because we work in an eye hospital, uh, the patients with dominant mutation don't tend to get severe neurological deficits, which again is a good thing. And what we did is we uh, looked after uh, the, all the groups of patients that have been coming to see us over the years. And we have 37 patients on our database with confirmed mutations. Uh, 18 of them have recessive mutations. 19 of them have dominant mutations. And uh, this is uh, data which is still unpublished and we're hoping that you know, we can uh, provide this uh, to the wider scientific community in the near future. And roughly speaking, you know, uh, the age at which optic atrophy was first diagnosed varies remarkably, uh, depending on whether you have a recessive mutation or a dominant mutation. But on average, you know, patients with visual loss uh, become symptomatic in the first two decades of life. And, you know, people who come to the eye clinic will often, uh, you know, um, wonder why it takes so much time, but for a very simple reason, because very often you, you're going to be having tests done before, like visual fields, and then we also put dilating drops in because this gives us a much better view of the back of the eye. And what was also quite striking is that when we look at patients with recessive mutations, uh, at their first visit, vision was roughly around 636, which is one line below the top letter on the chart. So already there is significant visual loss. When we look at patients with dominant mutation, vision is much better. So a vision of 612 is more or less what you need in terms of driving. So you can already see that very early on, there's already a very big difference between dominant and recessive mutations. And the reason why dominant mutation have better vision uh, lead to better vision and better visual prognosis, again, we don't know. This is an observation which will need to be uh, you know, investigated further in terms of the underlying disease mechanism. And we're also very fortunate to have uh, you know, Christian Brock uh, help us with some of the data analysis here. 
And if you look at the chart here, I'll go through this very slowly so that everyone understands what we're doing here. This is a graph which is plotting vision on the y-axis, what we call log mall vision, right? So as the vision, as you go up the chart, as you go up the axis, vision is getting worse, right? If you look at the x-axis, this is age, right? So each line represents one patient. The red line are patients with dominant mutations, and the emerald green uh, line are patients with recessive mutations. So already looking at this here, you can see clustering. So the dominant mutations are one side, the recessive mutation on the other side. And what is also quite clear is that vision is getting worse with time, which all of you will know. This is something which, is, uh, which invariably happens. What we can also do, and that's what uh, statisticians can do, is they can model you know, how the whole group is behaving. And very clearly, these two groups are quite distinct. So if you look at the line here, the darker line, the darker red line, the darker emerald green line, represents all the dominant mutations and all the recessive mutations grouped together. And very clearly what you can see here is that there is progressive visual loss. There is much faster rate of visual loss in the recessive group compared with the dominant group, right? And what also seems to happen is as you grow older, you tend to lose vision more quickly. That needs to be confirmed, but potentially what is happening is that as you're losing more cells, then your reserve gets less. And the more you lose, the more impact it has on you. So again, I'm just putting it out there because this is fresh data, but this is something which I think is something which is also relevant in terms of how we manage and treat patients in the future. And as your vision gets worse, unfortunately this will also affect your field of vision, right? So if you look at this visual field here, if you look at the one on the left hand side, this is what you see you know, through your eye, right? But as your vision gets worse, you tend to lose more and more of your central vision. And unfortunately, if that progresses to uh, a very uh, dense central scotoma, you end up not being able to see any letters on the chart. The other thing as well that we've been using is using retinal imaging, because it's something which is very useful, collects objective information, and it tells you about the state of the optic nerve and the retina at the back of the eye. It's non-invasive. No needles involved, you basically just put your chin on the machine there, takes the images, it's very quick, very fast. And what it does is it gives you beautiful images of the back of the eye. It tells you about the structure, the thickness, and also we can decide whether things are changing over time. And we use that all the time to look at the optic nerve and to look at the uh, retina. And what we can even do is we can segment the retina. As I've mentioned before, there are different layers and we can look at each layer in all its uh, slight detail. I'm not going to go over this in any great detail because of time, but clearly it's not a big surprise that when we do these measurements in patients with Wolfram syndrome, there is significant thinning of the retina and significant thinning of the optic nerves. And again, unfortunately, this tends to be worse in patients with recessive WFS1 mutations. What we still need to do is we still need to look into that more carefully to check whether specific types of mutations tend to do worse compared with others, what we call genotype-phenotype correlation. But the problem, slight problem with Wolfram syndrome is a relatively rare disease, but I think this is something also which is relevant in terms of how we conduct future treatment trials. What was also very striking and what was observed actually by Anna Magenda, who was my previous fellow, and who now works in Helsinki in Finland, is that when we look at the retinal structure, some of these patients have these very peculiar lamination defects. So if you look at this picture here, if you look at what the yellow arrow is pointing to, you can see this little slit, this little space, right? What we call a lamination defect, right? And what was even more striking is that you see this in all dominant patients with WFS1 mutations but you don't see this in recessive WFS1 mutations. Again, something which is very peculiar. What is it telling us? We don't know, but this is something which needs to be looked into further. So these are just other examples here. Again, you see these little cysts, these little lamination defects.
very consistent and you only see them in the recessive group. So we've talked about this nice uh, uh, pathway, eye, optic nerve, brain, right? What we can also do is we can measure how quickly the signal is being transmitted from the eye to the brain. Right, and that can give us very useful information, especially in young children who are not very good at doing all the other tests. So it's very straightforward. You know, if you have a good technician who can play with a child, it makes it like a little game. They sit in front of a big plasma screen. They have these little stickers on their forehead and on their ch uh, cheeks, nothing uh, threatening, nothing which is going to cause any pain. And then what we do is we have these fancy little programs which are these checkerboard these alternating grids of black and white spots and what it's allowing us to do is to measure the speed and the strength of the signal as it goes from the eye to the brain it's quite complex i rely on some very good people at morpheus who are very expert at doing these tests also analyzing the test but this is something which can be very helpful in our line of work and really, again, I'm just going to summarize some pretty complex data, but in Wolfram syndrome, because you have damage to the optic nerve, so the signal gets to the brain for sure, but it is delayed and it is weaker. And that explains again why you have reduced visual function. So this was a, an overview of why you get optic nerve involvement, how this translates into loss of vision, and this very distinctive difference between dominant and recessive mutations. And very briefly, I'm just going to mention about treatment strategies because this is something to which to some extent is frustrating for all of us. Frustrating for the family, frustrating for the patient because every year they come back every six to 12 months and you know there's nothing that we can offer in terms of stopping the progressive loss of vision. And Wolfram syndrome is not the, the only one. There are other patients I look after with labels optic neuropathy or with dominant optic atrophy where progress is happening, but progress is happening slowly and not fast enough to be able to rescue vision in a lot of patients. And I'm saying this not to be uh, in a, um, negative because I'm actually very optimistic that the next few years are going to see tremendous uh, you know, breakthroughs because of all the new models that we have, uh, better technology and also more you know, uh, um, uh, more sophisticated ways of assessing visual function. But clearly, our objective is to save retinal ganglion cells, protect the optic nerve, and preserve vision. Very easy to be said in a presentation, very difficult to deliver in practice. And I tend to view that in a rather simplified way. One way of doing this is with drugs with neuroprotective properties or we go down the route of gene replacement therapy, or perhaps a bit more ambitious, we try and correct the genetic mistake, and then we use stem cells as well uh, uh, to help us with this uh, uh, treatment strategy. So in terms of protecting the remaining retinal ganglion cells, stabilizing vision is very important, but stopping it in its track is what we should be aiming for really, right? And in terms of neuroprotection, which is a bit of a vague term but really what we're trying to say here is retinal ganglion cells are part of the central nervous system we want to save them how can we do this right one option is to use existing medication so-called drug repurposing lots of advantages here the drugs have already good we already know about the safety profiles or been approved by the european medicines agency or the fda so the route from the lab to the clinic to the patient is much faster the other route that you can employ is actually getting new drug molecules, things which are much more specific potentially, much more targeted. <clears throat> but the problem here is that you're starting from virgin territory and it can take much longer to get it to clinic. <clears throat> but despite the challenges, this is an important aspect of how we move forward in terms of drug screening, right? So how do we do this? Well, one option is we collect samples from patients. A lot of uh, patients are very generous and have provided us with skin samples with the years, which gets converted into these little cells. And you will have heard already how these cells will be converted into stem cells. Or we could test these on animal models. And there's quite a few animal models now 
we are working on the zebrafish model. There are groups in Estonia, in the US, and in France who are working on mouse models. So I think all of these are highly comp complementary, and all of these can be used to guide future clinical trials. Because let's face it, running a clinical trial takes a huge amount of time and effort. And if we're going to do this, we need to be really sure that we have something which has a better chance of working rather than just inform guesswork. So we were quite lucky to receive funding from FIFO side, and also I'm grateful to the Wolfram uh, Syndrome UK for providing some funding uh, to uh, the work that we're doing. And this was the work of George Kearns during his PhD, and he, we think we now have a very good model of uh, uh, Wolfram Syndrome using uh, a zebrafish model, and we plan to use this model in the future to potentially do some further drug screening. But I'm putting this out there because you know, having run clinical trials now for many years, I've learned a few things, including a lot of my major mistakes over the years. And I think clearly we need the basic science, right? Without good science, we can't move forward. But this is only one part of the puzzle because ultimately what we want is a treatment, either a partial treatment or a slam dunk, as the Americans want to put it, right? Something that completely stops the disease in its track. But what we forget is that in between, there is a huge attrition rate, right? A lot of the discoveries that we make never make it to clinic for the very reason that they do not show any efficacy further down the line. A huge amount of money goes into this, mind-boggling amounts of money, take usually at least eight to 10 years before you know where you're heading. And even then, you know, it might not be the earth-shattering effect that you want. Having said that, you know, we've been very fortunate. Um, unfortunately, we can't meet in person, but led by groups in France with no one, you know, we've uh, traced in the UK with Stephen in the US. Now there's an international network of centers and that will be very important in terms of pooling resources and doing trials, not just doing trials, but we need trials that have enough patients to give us a clear cut answer. Because the biggest mistake that you can make is you start doing a study and it does not have the power, the statistical power to give you the answer that you want. We've heard about the Trig Wolfram uh, trial, which is going to be a seminal trial because it shows that we can do a randomized control trial in this condition, and the results will come when uh, the patients have been fully recruited. Very briefly, I think the other area which uh, to us of time is really taking off is gene replacement therapy. And you know, I won't have time to mention this, but you know, there are some very good uh, promising results coming from other forms of inherited optic neuropathies. But to me, the reason why it's quite attractive, at least conceptually, is because in Wolfram syndrome, we're dealing with not having enough of the protein. So if you don't have enough of something, then the obvious thing is let's replace it, right? We'll put the gene back in there, produces enough of the protein, and hopefully this will at least stop the disease. And unfortunately, we've lost a fantastic colleague and a fantastic friend in the form of Christian Amel, who passed away now for already three years, uh, time flies, but, I have very fond memories of Krishna. He would invite me to uh, Montpellier every two years to run a course there uh, because I, I can't speak French, but it, I, I must tell you, uh, it's, it's very stressful giving a presentation in French, but unfortunately we've lost him uh, and we hope that his work and his legacy will carry on. But some of the uh, work that Krishna Amel's group in Montpellier has been doing is actually showing that gene therapy for uh, Wolfram syndrome is not uh, a science fiction. And the reason for this is because we know that the eye is an ideal target organ. We can easily inject things in the eye and it also allows us to put the gene therapy exactly where it should be, very close to the retinal ganglion cells. I'm not going to go into this, but to inject a gene into the eye, you need a viral vector because viruses are very good at infecting cells as we've, uh, as we've come to realize with the uh, COVID virus. But Having said that, it's not that straightforward because there are so many forms of these uh, viral vectors. But for, for most eye gene therapy program, what we're using is the AAV2 vector. I'm just mentioning this because you might come across this when you're reading things uh, on the internet. And the good thing about this is that we can target these retinal ganglion cells, which are very important because this is what makes up the optic nerve. And the work that has been done in Montpellier does show very nice data that in their mouse model, they're able to get at least some partial improvement of visual function. So 
I think this is interesting data. I'm hoping that there, there has been future work that has been done in this, in this field because potentially ocular gene therapy is one important uh, option in terms of how we move forward uh, for prevention of visual loss. And very quickly, I think this is something which is worth mentioning, is in addition to replacing the gene, what we could also do is actually correct for the gene mutation. And there are ways to do that now, right, which was not possible five years ago. And, you know, uh, this, this era of targeted genome editing is something which is really fascinating. And I suspect a lot of people will be, uh, uh, you know, uh, winning Nobel Prizes for this. But in, this, in a certain way, what it is, it's a very elegant pair of DNA scissors that allows you to remove and correct the spelling mistake, right? So you can do that. And imagine if you could do that, then what you could do is you take a skin cell from a patient, you turn them into stem cells, you correct the mutation, and then you could convert them into various cell types, you know, uh, islet cells for the pancreas, retinal ganglion cells uh, for the optic nerve. But I'm not saying that this is going to be used for transplantation because you can't just inject these retinal ganglion cells into the eye because they must make the right connection, which is quite difficult. A lot of people working on this, but I think this is a big challenge. I think the reason of putting it out there is to make sure that people are conscious of the fact that there are uh, some rather you know, um, you know, uh, odd uh, treatment being provided on the internet saying, we, you come to our clinic, we'll give you an, a stem cell injection of some sort or the other. So I think you need to be aware of, of, of treatment that do not have the right evidence base. But what you can do with these retinal ganglion cells once you produce them, again, you can use that for drug screening. I think that is something which will become important as we move forward. So in summary, you know, optic atrophy is a defining feature of Wolfram syndrome. Unfortunately, uh, you know, we do not have any treatment at the moment to, to prevent further visual loss. And it's quite clear that unfortunately, the majority of patients have recessive mutations, and this group has much more rapid progression of the visual loss. Uh, my personal feeling, it's just my feeling, is that we will need a combination of strategies, a combination of drugs, gene therapy, uh, because the, the disease is quite complex and we can't, um, I can't personally think that we can stop everything using just one treatment. And gene therapy, I think, is something which has a lot of future in this, uh, in this area of research. So that is us on a very rainy day in Paris in June 2018. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't meet in, in France this year because of the COVID outbreak. Uh, but hoping for better times where you can all meet face to face. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patrick. That was a really, really interesting talk. And we've got questions coming in already and someone has raised their hands um, as well for a question. Um, so I have a question that's come in prior to um, today. So I'll start with that one. And the question is, what can patients do to keep their sight stable? At the moment, the disease, we can't stop the disease process. But I think what is very important is in addition to aiming for specific treatment, the rest still applies. You know, you should not be smoking because we know that smoking affects uh, your mitochondria. They can affect your vascular supply. So I think smoking is a complete no-no as, as I'm concerned, right? It is also very important. Uh, it is just general lifestyle measures that people need a healthy diet, right? So try and maximize what you can do, what is under your control, right? Because the rest, unfortunately, is not under my control or your control, right? So my advice is no smoking, you know, a sensible drinking and a healthy diet because this applies to both the ocular problems and also the more generalized problems that you can get with Wolfram syndrome. Okay, thank you. Um, so, I'll go through on the Q&A first. Um, we have a comment, nice presentation. What is dying first, the retinal cells or the neurons from the axons? Again, this is a very, uh, you know, very, very important question. My, my personal feeling based on some extrapolation, what we see on the uh, OCT is that we're getting some pretty early loss of these retinal ganglion cell bodies, right? before we see the axonal loss. But I think there are going to be different mechanisms, right? Because there, are, there is also good evidence 
that you also have axonal damage and potentially also demyelination, right? Um, and to some extent, it is academically important to know where it's starting, but would it change how we intervene in terms of potential gene therapy or neuroprotection? I'm not sure. And the reason why we can't really answer this question is that there are very few uh, uh, post-mortem studies done on eyes from patients who've kindly donated uh, tissues after they've passed away, right? So I think this is something which is not just a question for Wolfram syndrome, but applies to most of these inherited optic nerve diseases. Are you losing your cell body first, which is located within the retina, or are you losing the axons that go back towards the optic nerve? I think it's a question that we'll keep that we'll keep asking until we have definitive evidence of what it is. But my personal feeling is that we're losing these cell bodies quite early on because we see quite significant thinning within the macular area very early on in the disease process. Lovely, thank you. Um, question from Fumi. He says, any difference between the missense and nonsense pathogenic variants? Fumi, unfortunately, I can't answer this right now because I think it's something which is being analysed. Uh, I totally agree with you that this is something which uh, makes absolute sense because on the one side, you, with the nonsense mutations, you have, I guess, loss of the protein, whereas the missense mutation, you might have a dominant negative or a gain of function um, in a, um, a, a, in a effect. We might not be able to answer this based on our uh, limited uh, patient cohort, uh, but it's something that we will look into further. My suspicion is that we probably don't have the numbers to be able to give a categorical uh, answer. I think what is much more categorical is the difference between uh, dominant and uh, recessive mutations, really. Lovely. Uh, we then got, thank you for the great talk. Did you find the lamination defect in the macular area only or further away from the disc? Um, we, we, we're seeing it mostly within the central macular area. I think that's probably because of the structure there. Um, but I think this is something which I find really interesting. And someone came up with some very elegant hypothesis about why this might be the case that might involve these Muller cells and, and calcium uh, dysregulation, which is crucial, I suspect, to the disease process. Uh, and I think you know, it remains to be disproved. But when we actually published that paper, time flies, I think it's about four years now, uh, we thought, well, let's put it out there. But the more patients we see in our clinic, the more we see. So I think this is definitely some kind of biomarker of uh, these dominant mutations, really. Okay, lovely. Um, we then have the question, do all patients lose sight or is it possible for the degeneration to stop or slow significantly? The reason I ask is that my daughter was diagnosed with OA at 12 and she is now 17. Her ophthalmologist says there has been no further decline. Again, there's, there's big variation. I think invariably in Wolfram syndrome, you get progression. You can get faster rate of progression or slower rate of progression. Um, and I think it, it's too early to say, right? And to be very honest about this, because to some extent, you know, you have a much greater reserve when you're younger. And as you lose your retinal ganglion cells, sometimes you reach little tipping points where you, you, you become more aware of, of losing vision and then things plateau again, and then you lose a bit more vision. Um, but I think Wolfram syndrome uh, is invariably progressive, right? Whether or not you can detect the change uh, within two, five, ten years, if you compare vision now with what vision will be in ten years' time, there will be a decline. What we don't know is why some people decline faster compared with others. Okay, lovely. We then have the question, can CRISPR be used to fix other symptoms such as diabetes, etc.? Here we're stepping out outside my area of expertise, but I think I would just say that essentially, you know, this whole area of trying to correct uh, mutations uh, is still in, in its infancy uh, because uh, you need to make sure that by correcting one area, you're not causing spelling mistakes in other areas, right? Which could be disastrous because this could lead to cancer formation, for example. So I think this is something which I find extremely interesting I think there must be much more work done in terms of the applicability to different organs, the safety for different organs, and then also how you apply that for specific disease subtypes. But there are people working with Wolfram syndrome, like, like Fumi, for example, who will be much more you know, expert at this than me. Lovely. Um, I have a question here that asking, how does Wolfram syndrome affect color vision? Are you able to 
answer. <laughs> yeah, I think this, this is something which is, which is uh, very distinct to these optic neuropathies. That very often, even in the early stages, when vision is still pretty good, color vision is affected much more compared with reading something down the chart. And the reason for this is because color vision is something which is intrinsically related to the function of these retinal ganglion cells. So early loss of color vision, severe loss of color vision is something which is seen in the majority of patients with Wolfram syndrome. Lovely. Um, next one is, any gut feeling on how long in the future a realistic gene therapy might be available for the ganglion cells of a Wolfram patient? Well, I think it, these things can happen quite quickly. By quickly, I mean meaning that we have the technology, right? AAV2 vectors is something which is used for, you know, very frequently now for a number of uh, ocular gene therapy programs. Uh, I'm not sure what is the latest from Morphidia. Unfortunately, we could, meet, could not meet this year, but you know, certainly you know, if there is convincing preclinical data and safety data that correct the level of Wolframin, is doable, safe, then you know that can move very quickly to a, an early phase uh, human clinical trial. But having said that, these the jump from doing the uh, preclinical study to doing a uh, gene therapy program is very expensive, right? And the funding needed for this, we're talking about millions of euros here, really, right? So I think there will be probably me, need to be. Uh, uh, good collaboration between academia and industry because that's the only way of making things move forward. Lovely. Um, we then have a very informative presentation. Uh, thank you. Is there any benefit from nutritional supplements as with macular degeneration? My personal view is we're dealing with mostly in you know, uh, young people here and if the diet is sufficiently good I don't think there's any need for any additional supplementation. We, we tend to use supplementation uh, for uh, more elderly patients with age-related macular degeneration. So there is no evidence that these supplements will help. Having said that, they are also safe because you can buy it from any uh, health store over the counter. But I don't personally recommend uh, buying uh, additional supplements if uh, someone has a good diet uh, and is able to have things naturally. Lovely. Um, I don't know if this, I think this question from Fumi probably sort of links with that. He says, what do you think about COQ10, idobenone, TUDCA and 4PBA for optic nerve atrophy? Yeah, I, 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 there's, there's good evidence of, for idobenone in terms of the mitochondrial function. Um, a lot of people might be aware that idobenone uh, is approved for use for patient with labor's optic neuropathy. Uh, under the label, under the uh, brand name of Raxone. Um, it's not a, a definitive treatment because only a proportion of patients treated uh, with Idebna and uh, Raxone will benefit. There are isolated, um, you know, case reports of patients doing well with Idebna, but I think to really dig deep into this story about Idebna, I think we need a bit more preclinical data. And then potentially after that, it could easily be done as a as a as, as a randomized control trial because uh, you know this is a drug which uh, now has a license in Europe, for example, and again could be used with different uh, these altogether. As for other drugs that might help with their antioxidant properties or their you know mitochondrial neuroprotective properties or even those of endoplasmic stress, I think again uh, these are you know uh, drugs which are candidate drugs, right? We've seen how challenging uh, it is to run a randomized clinical trial. And before we invest the time into it, it, the next one, I think having the preclinical data is absolutely critical, right? And again, the other, the other, uh, the other I guess, uh, fundamental decision that we all have to make is, you know, do we go for drugs which exist already, repurposing existing drugs, or do we take the bigger challenge of coming up with new molecules and then having to do the whole process from preclinical safety testing, early phase, uh, definitive phase three clinical trials, which takes 10 years, right? There's no way out of this, right? Uh, we've just been involved with, with a gene therapy trial for uh, labor's optic neuropathy. And thinking back to when we first thought about this, eight years have already gone down the line, really, right? So these things take time, right? Uh, but we need to do it. Uh, and there are no other shortcuts for this. And I think we need to be very clear. 
safety is, no, is the number one factor. Second thing is we need to know about efficacy. And thirdly, you know, we need to be scientifically rigorous and test this with proper, uh, properly powered studies. Wonderful. Um, I then have the question, um, this young lady, she's been, hasn't been told what type of optic nerve atrophy she has apart from bilateral optic nerve atrophy. She's noticed over the years her eyesight has got worse and she says, what is the percentage that she'll pass this on to her child as she's currently 22 weeks pregnant? Right, so optic atrophy uh, refers to the damage of the optic nerve and this is just a descriptive term, right? What is more relevant is the level of visual function which is left. And there are various ways we can use to measure that. The most obvious one is measuring vision, right? So we don't grade optic atrophy. You either have optic atrophy or you don't have optic atrophy, right? And it's a bit difficult for me to comment on uh, the risk of transmission because uh, I suspect uh, it all depends on whether we're dealing here with, with someone who has a recessive mutation or a dominant mutation. So I think this is something that needs to be discussed with all the information with genetic counselor mm -hmm. and also with the right information here, because we, we really don't want to give the wrong information here. Yep, no, that's fine. I was thinking I'd sort of uh, pass that on to um, Dr. Denise Williams here. Um, then have, uh, with the recessive patient cohort, is there a particular age that you have seen total loss of vision? Um, total loss of vision is rare, right? Um, I think I can think of one person who unfortunately uh, is not able to perceive light, but this is the extreme case, right? Uh, very, uh, the most common scenario is that the vision loss progresses, you're unable to read down the chart anymore, but you still retain a, a reasonable peripheral vision. But as for everything, you have the extreme, the, the worst case scenario where people lose all vision in one eye, right? That's sad, but it happens. Wonderful. Um, we then have, um, just to give you a, a brief break, um, Patrick, we have um, Professor Varnia Broccoli um, on call as well from uh, Italy. And um, Tim said it might be a nice idea to ask him as well about the gene therapy. Um, so I will allow him to talk if he would sure. like to unmute. Um, and answer the question um, that we had about gene therapy. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, thanks for actually get to me. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Actually, yes, we can. Right. Sorry to put you on the okay, spot. So, please, uh, so hello to everyone. Uh, um, uh, thanks for the question. Actually, uh, well, uh, I think I'm totally agree with what the, actually the, the what was actually already said. Uh, I think one important thing to actually underline is that although we have a incredible, powerful um, viral tools uh, to tr to actually use into mouse models for high disorders, I think uh, there are still some challenges in the viral tools. Uh, uh, we need uh, to actually uh, target uh, ganglion cells into primates or uh, eventually also into the humans. So we still need some uh, uh, improvement in the viral tools to actually having really the right uh, means uh, to, to actually have an efficacy uh, gene therapy for um, high disorders uh, uh, targeting the uh, retinal ganglion cells. Having said that, I mean, these tools are really developing really fast at the moment. So uh, no doubt that in a few years, we will have even more powerful viral tools uh, to actually target the ganglion uh, retinal cells. And I think another shortcoming that we face uh, at the moment for actually developing the gene therapy tools for uh, Wolfram syndrome is that we still don't know whether the uh, whether the um, uh, problems and the uh, uh, um, uh, that we that these retinal ganglion cells have is actually a cell autonomous defect or might also depend by non cell autonomous defects which can. Uh, be due to alteration in, in other cells. It was said before that maybe Mueller glial cells may be equally affected. So we have to do preclinical work here to understand whether 
uh, this mutation is actually leading to the uh, alteration in ganglion cells in the cell autonomous or even other retina cells uh, are affected and can contribute to the loss of sight. Yeah. I totally agree with you, um, uh, Vanya. And uh, I think this is an area where I think this is something which will run in parallel, right? On the one hand, you can't wait and you have all the answers and we need to employ the current technology that we have. But on the other hand, we need to basically try and you know, with the help of virologists, people who have all the technical know-how, how we can improve the efficiency of transduction of retinal ganglion cells, how potentially with robotics, we might be able to have a much more control where we're injecting things very close to the optic nerve, um, and also how we can potentially augment these gene therapy uh, paradigms, not only just replacing a gene, but there's also a whole area of research now in other optic neuropathies about using neurotrophic factors, right? So I think this is an area where you know, uh, we're very good at coming up with uh, potential strategies, but we have to start somewhere. And I guess, you know, the obvious strategy is doing a, a gene replacement uh, paradigm. Lovely, thank you very much. I realize we've just gone over time, but I have just one last question that's come in. Um, following a comment, is 1% plus vision common in both eyes? And is it likely to, ve to develop into total loss as you mentioned, it is rare to have complete loss of vision. Um, so if I understand correctly, someone says that he or she has 1% of vision left. Is that correct? I think so. It's um, her support, the person that she supports. So I think she's right. saying... I'm not yeah. sure because we don't take the yes. presentation. Um, but I think w one of the things which clearly is something which... Uh, which I find extremely you know, uh, you know, uh, difficult and challenging actually, is that there is a big variability, right? In terms of how people progress with time. We can only talk in, when we, when we make statements like this, that vision gets worse, that dominant mutation are better than recessive mutation. We're talking about at the population level. We've put people together in groups, uh, but what it does not tell us, as you've seen from the graph, is that these lines go in all types of directions. So we can only talk about the trajectory of a specific group. The individual change is something else altogether. And I think that the, the positive message I want to put across here is that the majority of patients with Wolfram syndrome lose their central vision, which is, which is really uh, in the difficult because this is what we use for reading, driving, everything that needs precise vision. But it is rare. I can, and that's why I mentioned I can count uh, on the hands of one finger, the, the fingers of one hand about patients that really have lost all their vision. I can only think about one person actually. So this is not the, uh, the typical presentation. Okay, lovely, thank you very much. So we've uh, just gone over time as I said. Um, I'd like to thank Patrick for fantastic presentation. As always, you explain everything so clearly and brilliantly um, and obviously you've had a ton of questions um, i hope everyone's happy with the questions if you have any more then please do send them to me afterwards and i will then send them on to uh, patrick thank you um vanya as well for sort of stepping in to answer that question um, sorry i put you on the spot um, but thank you very much um, and i'd just like to thank everyone for joining us um, today with all of our presentations and the workshops this morning. Uh, I hope you found it beneficial. The presentations will 